Well, thank you very much. Can, um, can I be heard, not too echoey? If, if, okay, good. Well, I'm, I'm thrilled to be here. It's very exciting. And to talk about these magnificent lady Bible hunters, uh, Agnes and Margaret, particularly in this year where we're celebrating so much about the Bible, the King James Bible, and uh, where we've just seen last year the first time publication of the world's most ancient Bible, the world's most ancient book, the Codex Sinaiticus. And this story, this true story, touches, I hope, on all these things. But begins here, um, uh, at least for me, and this is in Cambridge. This is Westminster College, originally built as the Presbyterian College in Cambridge, now URC, and you see over its welcoming gates, you see this uh, ironwork which contains an emblem, the burning bush, um, nec tamen consumabatur, and it was consumed, which is a motto, it has to be said, for the worldwide uh, Reformed Communion, but is of special reference to the ladies that founded this college, Pres uh, Westminster College, Mrs. Gibson and Mrs. Lewis. But their story begins not in Cambridge at all. It begins in Irvine in the 19th century when they're born twin daughters to a local uh, lawyer in 1843. And they're his first children. And very sadly, his wife, Margaret, died uh, only a month after they were born. And so his, their father brought them up. Um, as far as they knew, they had no other relations in the world but this father. He was a very loving father. He brought them up somewhat eccentrically in that he brought them up more or less as he would have brought up sons. He let them ride fairly freely around the countryside. He educated them very highly. And uh, he gave them a good deal of independence. And he also taught them that if what you were doing was right and there was nothing wrong with it, you shouldn't care what people think. He very profoundly didn't care what people thought as long as you were properly God-fearing. He was a devout uh, Presbyterian man. And, uh, and this seemed to have stuck with his daughters. What also stuck with his daughters is a great deal of money. Now, their father... Um, <laughs> The father had, uh, was a poor boy. He'd been able, through Scotland's wonderful educational system, to go to university and become a lawyer. Uh, but he had um, a good piece of luck in that one of the, the people he worked with in Irvine, this is Irvine in the mid-19th uh, century, um, turned out to be one of Scotland's richest men. This fact was unknown to anyone in Irvine and even to this wealthy man himself. Uh, he, he was a very shy, retiring bachelor who had had four uncles who went to America, made huge fortunes and all died in testate. And this huge fortunes ricocheted down to their sole remaining relative, this nephew back in Irvine, uh, leaving him with an immense sum of money. Now the twins' father was his lawyer and worked a lot for him. And when this gentleman died, um, the estate was the largest that had ever seen probate in the courts in Scotland. And the twins' father was left a great deal of money probably about seven million pounds in today's money, maybe more. But it's clear that the twins' father, uh, John Smith, had already made a great deal of money. Um, the, the fortune that he inherited had come through investing in railways, and, and John Smith, too, was investing in railways at this time. So he was quite a substantially well-off man. Um, here's the earliest photograph we have of one of the twins. They were Agnes and Margaret, and this is Agnes aged about 14. Agnes was the older twin by one hour, and she was always the guiding twin. She was the ruling twin very much and took her responsibilities quite seriously. So at about this age, um, a rather, uh, their, their father had to um, go. He was the executor of this wealthy man's estate, and he had to go for a year to America to liquidate the assets, leaving the twins alone, which very hard time for them. I think you see Agnes looking rather solemn. And when he came home, um, he'd sent the girls to be educated. They'd done, by the age of 14, they'd done all the learning they could do in Scotland. And in fact, very few girls um, of whatever their social and economic background were educated at all beyond the age of 12 at this stage. And uh, uh, certainly it was unusual, but the twins were sent to Birkenhead to a school for the daughters of dissenters. I've never been able to find records of it, so if anyone's from Liverpool and can trace this school down for me, I'd be grateful. Uh, it existed then. And from then on, unusually, they were sent to a finishing college in Mayfair. Now, I say unusually because um, their father clearly despised any kind of posturing and snobbery, uh, but I think he also knew that his daughters were going to be substantially wealthy. Around the same time, he framed a will that protected their fortunes because 
this was before the Married Woman's Property Act, and on marriage, a woman's estate became entirely her husband. So he framed a will that protected his daughters against um, this kind of uh, danger, and he sent them to a finishing school where they would learn to to keep a good house, and run servants, provide a good table, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But I think my own feeling is that twins um, didn't take very well to being finished because. Um, <laughs> They, uh, they were great linguists. By the end of their lives, they spoke 11, 12 languages each. Uh, but they retained these heavy, heavy Ayrshire accents all their lives. And you know, the first thing that's happened in finishing school, the, the prime sign that you are finished is you don't still have, as I do, a Canadian accent. You have some lovely accent like Kate Middleton or something like that. But not so Agnes and Margaret. So when their father came back, he, he had been made this man... Um, uh, this rich man, Ferguson, sent up a bequest in Glasgow for charitable gifts to schools and churches, and the twins' father was made the, the uh, director of this bequest. So he moved the family from Irvine, which the girls had known all their lives, to a very small town called Kerbarkin. And uh, it was near Glasgow, but still very small. And what he expected, um, I don't know. Maybe he thought that it would be good stepping off point for getting his daughters married. Really, marriage was the only held thing held out for women at this stage. Um, that is, unless you were one of the bulk of women who had to work, you know, of course. Uh, um, but if you, marriage was, was the thing held out for women, whether by John Knox or, or by society at large. And uh, so I suppose maybe he might have thought that his highly educated daughters might marry a uh, uh, some clergyman in Glasgow or someone to do with the banking. But it was not to be, because when uh, they were 23 and still both unwed, he died, um, leaving them entirely alone, but very, very rich. Now, what should they do? Um, they decided to go down the Nile. Now, this... <laughs> This was an unusual decision for someone. You know how Victorians mourned. They had mourning cards with deep black borders all the way around them. But their philosophy was their father was in a better place. Mourning was for people who lacked some kind of deep faith. He'd always liked traveling. In fact, they didn't only benefit from his investment in railroads. The 1840s, the decade into which Agnes and Margaret were born, uh, was the decade that saw the expansion of the railways all across Britain and across Europe. And the twins were amongst the first to really do a lot of railway travel. They did this with their father, and he, um, discovering that they were quite keen on languages, made just this brilliant arrangement with them that I wish my parents had made with me, uh, which is for every language that they learned, he took them to the country, he promised to take them to the country where the language was spoken. So with this happy philosophy, uh, they learned English, they learned, well, they spoke English, they learned French and, and German and Italian quite quickly, and a lot of their happiest memories were of traveling with their father. So it was natural for them to think of a trip, but where to? Well, it wouldn't do very much if you just lost your father, um, however confident you were that he was in a better place to be in Saint-Tropez or someplace like that. Anyway, they'd been that kind of place, but more exquisite was the Nile. At this time, um, traveling on the Nile was pretty exclusive and very romantic. In the year they'd been at the finishing school, the then unmarried Prince of Wales, Wales had made a documented, a well-documented trip down the Nile. So it was very, very exotic. The Suez Canal was just reaching completion and uh, there was a great deal of interest in the whole thing. So what you did if you went down the Nile? Um, well, first of all, you had to get to, to Egypt, of course. And the standard way for British people to travel, even across Europe at this time, would be to hire a guide or a courier who's a sort of mobile travel agent who went with you all the way, you know, right from, as it were, your point of landing in France, and who made all the arrangements, booked your hotels, your carriages, your trains, your boats, whatever you needed. And, um, but Agnes and Margaret, clearly from their father, disdained this, and they rather um, said it's much more fun to make all these arrangements yourself because you get to talk to the local people. And if you know the local language, you shouldn't um, have any trouble. So instead of going the normal, the most direct way that someone might go to Egypt at this time, which might be to sail from Liverpool to Alexandria, they went all the way across Europe 
Um, they went all the way across Europe to Budapest, down the Danube to the Black Sea, to uh, Constantinople, and then on a, by packet steamer across the Eastern Mediterranean to Alexandria and then Cairo. Now, they couldn't do this entirely alone. They didn't want a courier. They knew there were only 23, so they had a chaperone, and this was a woman called Grace, who, Grace Blythe, who'd been one of their school teachers in London. She was also Scottish and very adventurous. And at only 38 was, you know, respectable, but not exactly elderly. So these three young women, unaccompanied, made, I think, quite an astonishing uh, traveling group in the 1860s, going all the way to the Nile. In the Nile, they hired one of these boats, a Dahabaya, and uh, this, these boats are designed with the living quarters um, on the back and various... Um, uh, elevated decks for the uh, passengers to recline upon, and then uh, lower decks where the servants worked. And, and hiring, the, the, fitting out a dahabaya was a big business. You, you couldn't at this stage just rely on doing everything yourself. You had to have an Eastern guide called a dragoman, and the dragoman would arrange everything for you, hire the cook, hire, hire the sailors, and uh, uh, provision the whole boat. And these boats at this time could uh, um, provide a high degree of comfort more and more people were doing this, and so um, Florence Nightingale writes of a trip at this time, and you could expect crystal, you could expect Rhone wines. In fact, you weren't supposed to drink water, so you were expected to bring some claret and some light white wines for refreshing your throat. And, uh, um, and you could expect a, a good deal of luxury on this boat. And I, I think you also expected to meet the sort of your um, actual interesting type of person traveling on the boat too. The guidebook, the guidebook you took, uh, apart from Murray's Guide to Egypt and Palestine, was Herodotus' histories in Greek. That's what they read. They read the Herodotus' histories in Greek. So anyway, I think Agnes and Margaret have managed to come in a trip of a lifetime. So exciting. Who will we meet? The answer was no one, because they had a crooked dragoman. I can't explain it to you now. You'll have to read the book. <laughs> but who virtually kept them in Perda on their own boat by telling them uh, with each party that they met that they would, um, the people had scandalous reputations and they, they would be blighting their own reputations should they uh, fraternize with them. And so it was. Um, Agnes and Margaret le learned the, the truth of their own best travel maxim, which was, never go to a country where you don't know the language. Now, they didn't know Arabic, and that's why they were so um, proficiently boondoggled in, in Egypt. Um, but they would learn it. Their, the result of this was not, we won't go to Egypt again, but we'll learn Arabic before our next vi visit. So coming back, you can imagine coming back to this tiny town of Kilbarkin would be very dull. And they decided, somewhat uncharacteristically for very um, Scottish patriots, to move to London. But the reason was that Grace, Grace was living in London. And this London they uh, lived in was really basically expat Scots. It all focused around the Presbyterian church, soup kitchens, Sunday school. Um, Margaret quickly wrote up a, a book about their travels and their virtual imprisonment by their dragoman, which was quite a success. And... Um, Margaret fell in love. Uh, she fell in love with a clergyman some 20 years their senior, um, who was charming and intelligent, um, but sadly, I think, given to what Victorians would call melancholia, we would say he, he probably suffered from depression, but um, like many people who suffer from depression, he was all very witty and droll uh, uh, when not poorly. Um, he had spent, he had been um, a Presbyterian minister, but at the age of 33, an inheritance had enabled him to, to resign his ministry, and he'd mostly spent his time going from spa to spa trying to recover his failing health. Well, the upshot of all of this for Margaret was that, who was very robustly healthy, for 14 years they had an engagement that was on again, off again, on again, off again, with him, you know, just about getting ready to marry, but then saying, oh, my darling, I am an aging hulk. Why tie yourself to this carcass? You are too young and beautiful, etc., etc." So anyway, that's, I, I invented that, but I think that's what he said. <laughs> that kind of stuff. Well, Agnes and Margaret weren't about really to... What are they doing in this time? They're doing stuff around their church. They're continuing to learn language. They learned Greek. They learned Hebrew to read their scriptures. They also learned modern Greek. This was amazing. They learned modern Greek because they mistakenly believed that the best guide to the way ancient Greek was spoken was the way modern Greeks in Athens spoke their language at the time. 
now. Um, this turns out to be not true. However, it was good for them because they decided to make a trip to Greece. And the idea was that um, um, Agnes would write a rather travel book. She tried her hand at writing a, a few novels, which had been ponderous flops. Um, they're, they're 900 pages long, and if you want to read them, be my guest. But the only copy I know of is in the Cambridge University Library, so book out a couple of months for sheer boredom, really. Um, <laughs> Stick with George Eliot, that was clearly um, Agnes's template, but she didn't quite get the same lift off. And uh, uh, so anyway, they, they decided to go to Greece, and Agnes would write this book. And here is Agnes in Greece uh, in 1883. And of course, they had a great advantage in Greece because they could speak Greek. Now, Englishmen and Scotsmen who had been to public schools anyway probably had done eight or nine years of Greek. They could read Greek well, but they couldn't have exchanged a single word with an actual Greek, nor can any of you if you learn Greek at theological college, because we learn it with Erasmus's pronunciation, nothing to do with the way Greeks speak the language. But Agnes and Margaret could. They traveled around. And uh, I think that Agnes had the mind that she'd be able, she wanted a book with a lot of local color. She wanted to be able to talk to sort of um, um, boatmen and, and publicans and shopkeepers. But Greece at this time, particularly as they were traveling in the Peloponnese on horseback, um, was still not long out of Ottoman rule. And the women were still in Perda. And they didn't even do their own shopping. And the men were completely unaccustomed to sort of being accosted in a strangely spoken um, Scottish Greek by a couple of young Presbyterian women with great hoop skirts and so on. Um, that appeared amongst them. But the people that they were welcomed by were Orthodox monks, rather surprisingly. But they found if they stopped at the monasteries, they were welcomed. The monks had biblical manuscripts. And although, in a way, Orthodoxy, the Orthodox Church represented everything that as Presbyterians they had been brought up to think was wrong in religion, you know, it's a processing and vast vestments and hats and bejeweled gospels and so on, nonetheless, they could see the monks did love the Gospels, and that was a good enough point. And Agnes pointed out, if you're in a tricky moment with an Orthodox prelate, you can always turn the subject to the Pope, and you can unite around a common enemy. <laughs> That's so um, anyway, other than getting to know monks, the great thing about this is um, Margaret's beloved, um, James Gibson was so distressed that his, his girlfriend should pass so par, far out of his purlieu that he actually adventurously met them in Germany and there married Margaret. And this is the photograph that he sent, they sent to announce their wedding. Um, here he is uh, looking, thinking about his move, shall I, shan't I, 14 years at the chessboard. <laughs> there we go, checkmate, he's really happy, you know. This is, um, so finally, he makes his move. So and now began a very happy period for um, James Gibson and Margaret, but also for uh, Agnes. And I want you to notice here how, what a lovely dress she's wearing. They, they um, uh, um, previous impressions have been given they were rather frumpy, but not, not at all. As young women, they bought their clothing uh, in Paris at Worth, who was the first couturier. And uh, they, they liked clothes, they liked jewelry. Um, they didn't think that was at all difficult to combine with the love of God and a belief in providence. So after a honeymoon, where you'll be pleased to know Agnes did not accompany the newlywed couple, but stayed back to learn Arabic, um, <laughs> they, they moved into a large house in Surbiton, near Surbiton. Um, they, they rode, they helped um, um, Gibson do various editors. He was very interested in S Spanish letters. They helped him do some translation. And here's another portrait of Margaret at this time. And so all was well. They were producing a, a number of writings, poems, and stories, which were they're publishing in a journal called The Presbyterian Churchman, based in Ulster. But uh, sadly, after just three years of marriage, um, Gibson, James Gibson, who all his life was thought he was dying, finally, when he least expected it, died. And um, to underscore the unexpectedness of this result, um, or this event, Agnes, who wrote a, a, a biography of her brother-in-law, said of the day of his death, he sent me out that morning to buy him long underwear, much in the spirit of a man who intended to wear it. <laughs> so 
Margaret now was heartsick and she loved this guy. He was clearly absolutely charming, very interesting. He was able to pull their legs and talk with them about everything that interested them. He'd opened a number of worlds to them. So uh, what should they do? Um, they decided to go to, to Cambridge. Mar uh, Agnes felt they needed another trip, but just time they just ventured as far as Cambridge. Um, this, I'm afraid, I've got a little bit out of sync. This is a trip that, that Agnes made with Grace Blythe what, during the time her sister was married. Um, Gibson wouldn't let uh, Margaret travel, but Agnes and her friend Grace traveled in Cyprus. And here they are. This is just to show you. This is the drawing Grace made to show the way they traveled in Cyprus with tents and mules. Um, but they, they went to Cambridge. They went to Cambridge because Cambridge was famous for its scholarship, its learning, uh, its um, beautiful courts and, and libraries and so on. And they spent a month looking around at all the things. And on the last day, they went to Corpus Christi College. And there, uh, Agnes got in a huge argument with the librarian, this man, Samuel Savage Lewis, who was a classicist. And uh, she got in a huge argument with him over the correct pronunciation of ancient Greek. And uh, within nine months, they were married. <laughs> now, he actually did say to her, will you come and see my etchings? Um, <laughs> because he had a number of etchings of Cyprus, and she was just about to bring out this book on Cyprus. And so um, they met, and they discovered they had many things in common. He, as well as being a classicist, was a collector of antiquities. He was an Anglican clergyman. And as soon as term was over, he was on the boat. He would be over in a few days or as soon as he could get there, someplace like Constantinople, trading for coins, gemstone rings, pots. He was a connector, collector of very early Jewish coins, shekels from the time of the destruction of the temple, uh, all of which can be seen in the Fitzwilliam Museum in Cambridge now where his collection is housed. And so he had, they had lots of friends in common. And here's a photograph of uh, Agnes at the time of their marriage. She's um, 44 years old at this stage. Now they um, set up home together and uh, it was a very exciting life because when I say that Lewis was a librarian, he was actually keeper of the Parker Library. I don't know if any of you know about the Parker Library. The Parker Library was set up by Archbishop Matthew Parker, who was an early, I think the earliest Archbishop of Canterbury. Matthew Parker was able to take advantage of the dissolution of the monasteries to buy up or perhaps obtain in other ways, a number of ma magnificent holdings. Half the Anglo-Saxon manuscripts in the world are in the Parker Library in Cambridge. The copy of the Gospels, St. Augustine's Gospels that he brought over when he was sent to convert the English is in the Parker Library and is brought out whenever a new Archbishop of Canterbury is enthroned. The, the first draft of the 39 Articles of the Church of England are in the Parker Library. Um, the, the bill for the cost of burning Cranmer in the stake is in the Parker Library. It makes quite interesting reading. It needs quite a lot of wood, really, and um, also what it costs to feed him. So anyway, he obviously knew a lot about manuscripts. They designed, he designed this house, um, which they called Castle Bray, and uh, it was designed as a house for all three of them to live in. Um, for scholarship and conviviality. The whole bottom floor could be opened up into one big room for, for parties. And they built a tower because um, they um, uh, were very keen, Agnes and Margaret, on daily exercise. And in the house they'd rented in Cambridge, they had scandalized the neighbors by exercising in their bloomers on parallel bars in the back garden. <laughs> In this house, they built it purpose-built with a tower with ropes in. They could exercise ropes, and they could exercise there. So they had a vast circle of acquaintance, including Solomon Schechter, who was a Romanian rabbi, who was the first uh, lecturer in rabbinics at the university. Mary Kingsley, who was actually not a Christian at all either, a Darwinist, who had become famous uh, as an explorer of West Africa. And it was a wonderful time for them. But, sorry to repeat, but after only three years, Samuel Lewis, too, died of a heart attack. And now it was Agnes's turn to be bereft. I think to have lost one husband, you know, found late in life is, is sad. But to lose two, albeit to different twins, is borders on the careless, really. And, um, <laughs> and you, you can imagine in those days, and particularly some like Cambridge, 
The men were your access to the life of the mind. These were women in their mid-40s now, 47. They didn't have children. They didn't have grandchildren. They had very little in common with a lot of the... They were just a generation before. They lived 20 years later. There would have been many more women like them in Cambridge, but there weren't at this time. No women could go to university in their generation and so on. So I think they felt that this wonderful world that had opened up with Agnes's marriage to Samuel was now closed down. And, and because of this, they were able to think, what would we really like to do? And they wanted to go to Sinai. They'd long wanted to go to Sinai and to see the remote monastery of St. Catharines. Now, this was not an easy trip and not a safe one. Um, you had to go to Cairo. You had to have a dragoman who had to get special camels and Bedouin drivers to take you 10 days across the desert. You had to supply, provision yourself for the whole trip and for whatever time you'd stay at the monastery because the monks couldn't provide you with provisions. They didn't have anything spare. But they wanted to do this. The risks were really, um, in many ways, risks of health. Cholera, you could get cholera on the boat, any kind of diseases. Small infection could be fatal in the desert. But I think they thought, really, we have nothing to lose. They would wanted to go to Sinai, of course, because of Moses' story. And I was so thrilled at our worship this morning that we ended with their favorite hymn, God Made the, the Great Redeemer, that great Sinai hymn. Everything about splitting the rock, the parting of the seas, Everything wonderful, the, the, one of the central, uh, primal narratives of Christian and Jewish faith, the story of Moses. But also Sinai had become very important in the monastery, very important since the 1840s, the 1850s really, when a young man, a young German called von Tischendorf, made a spectacular discovery of the Codex Sinaiticus, the world's most ancient Bible. Now, here are you know, a couple of words of, of a... Uh, more um, Bible sort. Uh, at the beginning of the 19th century, the oldest known manuscripts, handwritten copies of any of the biblical books that we had were not really that old. They were Byzantine. They were 9th, 10th, and 11th century. Uh, this was certainly known to the reformers. Erasmus, when he had prepared the Greek of the New Testament that became the basic text on which the King James and other vernacular Bibles were made, had had to work with four or five different manuscripts that were all ropey in different ways because of, over the years, you know, mice would eat parts, water would decay, and so on. Indeed, he'd had to translate um, a lot of the book of Revelation back from the Latin because he didn't have any Greek version of that. So it was a, Now, this had, this had been all right for a few hundred years, but in a more skeptical age, people were saying, well, how old is the Bible? We don't have any really very old copies of it. And maybe the books that we have are Byzantine um, transmissions that bear little resemblance to what Jesus and the apostles might have known. So the search was out to try to find older biblical manuscripts. And von Tischendorf was a very young man, and he was convinced, he was very convinced that there were old manuscripts out to be found. And he found in the 1840s at St. Catherine's Monastery, the remote St. Catherine's Monastery in the Sinai Desert, a Bible, a huge Bible of the fourth century, which antedated anything of similar completion um, by six or seven centuries. It was a spectacular find. The early fourth century takes it back to the time when Christianity is made legal by the Emperor Constantine. And there was even some thought that maybe this might have been a Bible commissioned by Constantine. I don't think the jury's out on that. Just because whoever commissioned this um, was a wealthy, wealthy person. It's so heavy, you may see it in the British Library, that um, it takes two men to lift it. It's got both the Old and the New Testaments, all the books we know, uh, some others, the Shepherd of Hermas, and it is, uh, was a transformation for biblical scholarship. So all this had made, Tischendorf has initially been very, very secretive about the provenance of his find. He'd hinted an Eastern monastery, but in the 1850s it came out that it was Sinai and St. Catherine's Monastery. And now, most people thought that von Tischendorf had found everything worth finding there. But this man, um, James Rendell Harris, a Quaker, uh, had, um, just around the time Agnes and Margaret were thinking about going, published a book. And he had been uh, out there, and he'd discovered manuscripts in Syriac um, that previously thought to be lost. He discovered something that the historian, course historian Eusebius had mentioned, but but everyone thought it had been lost. So he thought there might be other things um, there in Syriac that hadn't been examined. Now, Syriac is basically Aramaic, basically the language of Jesus and the disciples. 
right? So this was quite exciting to Agnes. And in the nine months between her husband's death and their going to Sana, I would have thought nine months is pretty quick to do anything, even to get, you know, cash from a cash point in nine points. But she taught herself Syriac. She taught herself Syriac from a German Syriac dictionary because there wasn't an English Syriac dictionary. And she said it wasn't difficult if you already knew Hebrew. But the script is entirely different. I don't read Syriac. I think it looks really difficult. But she, she did this. And they um, forged a, a meeting with James Rendell Harris, who was enormously encouraging. He was sort of a ticker type person, terribly excited. Oh, you speak Arabic, great. Oh, you speak great. Greek, yes. You must go. You must go to Sana. And he told them something he hadn't written about, which was in a dark closet off a dark room underneath the archbishop's lodgings at Sana were chests of manuscripts he had not had time to examine. And he thought they might contain some of the most ancient in the world going back to the earliest days of Christianity. And who knows, I mean, I think Agnes and Margaret at this stage um, thought maybe they might discover Matthew's gospel, sort of signed, I, Matthew, wrote this. But you never knew what you might find. So here's some photographs taken by Agnes and Margaret. Um, they, they, uh, the other thing Rendell Harris did for them is he said they must have a camera. He taught them how to use his own and helped them buy one. And um, he said, you'll need it for photographing the manuscripts. They'd only successfully taken two or three photos before they left. This one is actually from the Ecole Biblique uh, in Jerusalem, but it's a, a similar uh, vintage shot of a Bedouin. And there, the pleaks around Sinai. So they went, they went, and they made their way across the desert. Of course, many people in Cambridge said they wouldn't even be let in. The Orthodox monks didn't let women in, and they would go all the way across the desert to be pelted with stones. And indeed, a number of scholars had been pelted with skulls. But, but they arrived at the monastery. Here you see it with its um, wonderful uh, um, high walls. This uh, monastery that had been a, a church there from time immemorial, the, the Empress Helena was meant to have built a chapel dedicated to Mary on the site there of the burning bush, because that's why it's there, the site of Moses' well in the burning bush. Um, but she was building on an already existing structure. The present walls were built by rel that relative newcomer, the Emperor Justinian, and those are still there. And here you see the, and this is one of Agnes and Margaret's photographs. In, in the Eastern monasteries, because they were so um, often pillaged, you usually had to be hoisted up through a hoist house on the wall. Agnes and Margaret uh, w had letters from Rendell Harris, who the monks liked, and they also spoke Arabic and Greek. The monks were Greek speaking, and a lot of the reason the scholars were um, um, greeted rather poorly is many of the scholars spoke no Greek, and so they had no shared language. And they were admitted and asked what you would like to see, and Agnes said, all your oldest Syriac manuscripts, please, especially those that Mr. Rendell Harris had not had time to examine. So here you see the um, monks' quarters as they were and as they largely look now. And here you see, this is the burning bush, um, uh, a Victorian photograph of the burning bush with a couple of monks in front of it. It's a trailing raspberry. How many people have been to Sinai usually? Ah, yes, wonderful. And then you will recognize this is the burning bush as it is today. And here, right next to it, there's... <laughs> it's a fire extinguisher. Um, um, so, no green belt feelings there, please, you know. <laughs> so Agnes was taken down to the dark room off the dark closet. She hauled up a bunch of trunks, and out of one she picked this unpromising-looking glob. Uh, she could see it was Syriac, and the, she could read it. It was uh, Lives of Women Saints. But looking at it more closely, she could see that it was a palimpsest. Now, what's that? The vellum was so valuable that um, the monks used to recycle it. If a book became lost a few pages or they had many copies of something, they would take a knife and scrape the pages clean and use it as clean paper to copy something else on. But then after a couple of hundred years, the lower writing, the ink, had a tendency to peep through. And that's what was happening to this. This thing, was, all its pages were sort of gummed together. But Agnes could see behind the life of the women saints which was not an original manuscript, I should say. It was a copy of um, something that existed in multiple copies. 
Uh, she could see peeping through at the top of the pages, according to Luke, according to Matthew. So she knew that there was a palimpsest. She'd, her father had told them about palimpsest. And she had a great piece of beginner's luck because remember, she's only been studying Syriac for nine months, you know, a very short gestation period. And uh, so she, she has great luck that the overwriting is dated to 697. So she reckons that for a, a manuscript to impale the underwriting must be much older, and that was push it back towards the earliest dating of known Syriac Gospels. So then began a fight to photograph it. Now, um, they had brought a thousand negatives, but Margaret, her sister, didn't read Syriac and wondered, she, well, first of all, they're trying to photograph a palimpsest. Here's one of their photographs, courtesy of Westminster College. And um, you can see, the writing that you see is, is the lives of the women saints. You could barely, at the top, see if you, some fainter writing peep, peeping through. That would be the gospel. So you're trying to take photographs of something lying underneath the major writing. Margaret wasn't sure it was work. The librarian, Father Galactian, couldn't understand why they're interested in these dirty old chunks when the monastery possessed beautiful jewel-encrusted Bibles and wonderful things they possessed with. He couldn't understand why the, that they were interested in these old things. But um, Agnes, as ever, had her way, and they took about 390 photographs of this and photographs of a number of other things as well. In fact, so busy were they, it was very, very cold. They had to walk around this January, February, really cold there, even in March, if you've been, had to walk around in the mornings, clapping their hands on their sides to get warm. It was only on the last day that they really actually climbed the famous mountain. And for those of you who have not yet done it, um, do so at first possibility. There's Elijah's garden seen from above, where he famously heard not God uh, in the still small voice. And... This, you see the, the uh, monastery down below, that with those vast walls up to 20 meters high in places, they look minute from um, the, the mountains surrounding them. And so they took all these photographs, they spent 40 days at St. Catharines, and they dashed back to Cambridge, hugging these undeveloped uh, negatives. Very worried, the Ottoman um, uh, officials, uh, uh, customs officials might expose them. But the great thing was to hurry back and have some authentication from Cambridge from their find. But when they got back to Cambridge, it was the spring, and the scholars, that, it was early summer rather, and the scholars were leaving. Their friend, Rendell Harris, was only able to look at a couple of photographs. And the great thing was to receive the sort of um, imprimatur from the two people that really mattered in Cambridge, the two great Syriac experts, Professor ben Bensley and his young cadet, Francis Burkett. Now, here's Francis Burkett, as the age he was at that time, 33 years old. Now, um, Burkett and Bensley had been by skeptical. They knew, they knew Agnes and Margaret. They'd lived on the same street uh, um, at one time when Agnes and Margaret were renting before they'd built their house. But um, Professor Bensley had been one of those who'd said that the twins wouldn't even be admitted to the monastery. And certainly, he wasn't about to be overexcited about them thinking they'd found something. Um, and so, same with Burkett. These two men just wouldn't look at Agnes's photographs. Agnes wrote in a letter at this time, Mr. Burkett wouldn't even look at my photographs when I tried to show them to him in his own garden. Now, what circumstance that may be, a garden party where she pulls out her bag. You know. <laughs> um, but anyway, they, I think it's because Burkett and Bensie were the top of the tree um, they were on the inner circles of Cambridge intellectual life. Agnes and Margaret were just widows, just Presbyterian, just Scottish, just they didn't have any degrees. And an academy very confident of its own credentials was pretty sniffy about anyone else. And it was sort of like, oh, they think they found something, but they're excited lady travelers. So to get around this, the twins asked the beautiful, glamorous, and elegant Mrs. Burkett, age 33, to come to lunch and said, do bring Mr. Burkett. And they had laid, <laughs> at a certain stage in the uh, proceedings, which they had other distinguished guests, they said, and now, Mr. Burkett, you'll want to look at our photos. <laughs> <laughs> and they'd laid, they'd laid some of the best ones out in the piano, and Burkett had to look at them, right? So he, but to give him credit, he immediately realized they were quite important. He took some to show to Bensley. Then the twins got a telegram. People were always sending, and they sent a telegram four blocks in those days. The telegram saying, don't tell anyone about this top secret. We must meet at first instance. So they met at first instance, and the idea was to plan a trip to go back 
to St. Catherine's and transcribe it because it was indeed a very important manuscript of the Gospels. So what should they do? Well, um, the twins by this time were accustomed to traveling all over, including all over the East, unaccompanied even by chaperones. But it wouldn't do to travel with Englishmen, not their own husbands. So the resolution to this was that the English scholars would bring their wives. Persis Burkett came, previously thought to be rather delicate. She turned out to be quite robust, thank you very much, went on a camel. Um, <laughs> Mrs. Bensley, who is 66 and very nearly blind, here you see them uh, sleeping in the desert. It's not a very good photograph, but you see Mrs. Bensley with a white band around her hat, behind her Agnes, and behind with a beard, Rendell Harris, the Quaker scholar, who at the twins' request had come along too. And there, uh, dragoman Ahmed, who's always pictured smoking a cigarette. He's got a gun and a cigarette all the time. <laughs> there he is. Because he has to run a four-star hotel, all these tents going across the desert and so on. They go across the desert, and um, they get to Sinai, and they begin to transcribe the manuscript. It's quite cold at this time. Here's Professor Bensley still wearing a Homburg. Now, unfortunately, by the time they got to the middle of the desert, the twins realized that... Professor Bensley and the young Mr. Burkett did not at all want the Quaker Rendell Harris with them. They thought he wasn't as much of a Syriac scholar. Of course, he did, he did read Syriac. They thought that he might be just anxious to horn in on any spectacular new fights. So there's a certain amount, in fact, for Victorians, a spectacular amount of bitterness and uh, argument amongst them. And particularly, Professor Bensley, supported by his cadet, um, Burkett, felt that all honor of every discovery must be his. So um, here you see, um, it's warmed up a little. That's Father Gallic T in the Monk Librarian and Rendell Harris. And here you see, I like this one because there you see Professor uh, Bensley has shot, swapped his Homburg for a fez. And, um, and there's Mr. Burkett, who's quite a wealthy young man in plus fours. And, um, and Father Gallic Tian looking like he doesn't trust them very much, and he didn't, he didn't. Um, he didn't trust scholars, and of course, Burke and Benzie couldn't speak Greek, and he really trusted Agnes and Margaret, and it's a fantastic sign of the trust. What were Agnes and Margaret doing? The three, three men were taking it in turns to transcribe this manuscript. Agnes and Margaret had, been, uh, had asked if they could catalog the Syriac and Arabic holdings of the library. Now, Many scholars had asked to do this before. Now, you'll realize that if you've got manuscripts that are on catalog, it's a dangerous business because anyone could just steal something and you wouldn't know it was missing. By this time, none of the monks um, knew Syriac. I think some of them did know Arabic, but most of them just spoke Greek. And so this was enormously trusting of them to let Agnes and Margaret do the catalogs. Um, because it meant that they trusted them. They'd had so many things stolen by this stage. This is Ag Agnes's catalog, a uh, catalog page. This is of the Syriac text. This is Syriac into Greek, because she's doing it for the monks, and they don't read English. In the evening, she'd do one Syriac into English in her tent. And this is Margaret's um, catalog, Arabic into Greek. Imagine that they could do this, and apparently the catalogs still hand up very well. But this was another flashpoint for Professor Burke. Uh, Professor Bensley and Mr. Burkett, because they thought that this was another way. Rendell Harris was helping the twins um, when manuscripts were brought up to them. It wasn't the one book, one bound volume was just one book. You'd have five or six. You might have a copy of um, one of the Gospels, several of Paul's epistles, and then maybe a play, a Greek play, all bound in one volume. So you needed a fair amount of knowledge to determine what was in there. And uh, Rendell Harris was helping them. But Burkett and Bensley thought this was a sign that he was trying to horn in on the discoveries again. So a big fight blew up on the last day there. There you see Margaret sitting with all their crew. Who should, take, who should be involved in the publication? Who should take the credit? The, the Burkett and Bensley and their wives had the view that Agnes had discovered it only in the sense of someone like a child turning over a, a rock on a beach discovers a, a previously unknown form of centipede. But that wasn't Agnes's point of view. She'd studied Syriac. She knew about palimpsest. She thought it might be very old. She couldn't verify it and so on. So anyway, it was agreed that Agnes should write the introduction, and, um, but that she wouldn't get any help from Burkett and Bensley on this. And uh, a letter should be sent out announcing this great find, which up until now had been secret. 
Now you see this is another photograph of their waiter there uh, and their cook in the striped jacket. And here's some of the Bedouin drivers um, um, they have and the camels. So when the, by the time they went back to Cambridge, there had been a big fight because there had been a big fight about who should be involved in the um, publication of the book and who should claim credit with it. It was a really pretty nasty thing. And when they got to Suez, they went on their separate ways. Um, the uh, Burkitts decided to spend a few days in the south of France and the Bensley spent some time in Italy. Agnes and Margaret went home most directly, and they got back in Cambridge to discover that the world that they thought would be clamoring at this exciting find, you know, knew nothing about it. The letters they'd sent more than one, they'd sent to the Times, hadn't got through. And so uh, they'd been expected to be greeted almost, you know, um, at the docks at Dover with people with wreaths and such an exciting biblical discovery, not at all. Instead, two or three years later, uh, the London Evening News broke, broke the story as from their German correspondent. Now, that's a long story why that was so, but the, 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 story, the point is that it was broken elliptically and the published version mentioned with great excitement this fab fabulous discovery had been made at Sinai by two ladies. It was probably a, a second uh, in, in importance to a discovery at Sinai, only to the Codex Sinaiticus itself, and they were out in the, in the desert transcribing this with... James Rendell Harris, a well-known Quaker scholar, noticeably absent was any mention of Burkett and Bensley. <laughs> now, Mr. Professor Bensley in Rome, reading his newspapers, nearly had a heart attack <laughs> because it just vindicated his fear all the way along that Rendell Harris and the twins were trying to push him out of the picture. He was livid. He came back stomping with rage for two or three days because he he went to dinner in his college keys and he ate oysters and drank stout and died. And um, <laughs> now this, you know, people had told him not to go to Sinai because it's too dangerous, you might die there. But in fact, it was eating oysters in Keys College that killed him. And uh, so now it was really bad. Mrs. Mrs. Um, Bensley was deep in grief. She and the Burkitts weren't talking to Agnes and Margaret. They wouldn't give them the rest of the manuscript. I have to go quickly on through this. They say that oil was poured on troubled waters by this man, um, who was um, Professor William Robertson Smith, another Scot, very respected by them all, and was able to sort of um, manage to patch things up. Because by this time, Agnes had accepted not only the contract to be in charge of the publication of the transcription, but to do a translation of it. And if it fell flat, if anything was wrong with this, everyone in the Cambridge academic community would say, who did they think they were? She had nine months of Syriac when she discovered it. Who did she think she was? Everything that Burkett and Bensley thought about them would be vindicated. Instead, in about two and a half or three years, Margaret also taught herself Syriac. They worked hard. They brought out not only this transcription and the translation, but five or six other books with Cambridge University Press that were transcriptions of other manuscripts they'd found at Sinai. It was a triumphant success and Agnes was instantly elevated to the world of oriental scholarship. So it was just fantastic. It, could, it was the moment at which any wise person, and I must say that I think facing what they did, the, you know, the, the terrors of the desert were as nothing to the, 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 the hauteur of the academy, and I think that I would have backed down. But I think from Agnes' point of view, it was double or nothing. What better thing could she lay on the altar of the memory of her deceased husband, a clergyman, than this new Bible find? And so Agnes and Margaret were involved in the life of scholarship. They edited two huge series for Cambridge University Press. They went six times more back to the Sinai Desert. And um, they were involved. I, I'll mention briefly one other fabulous discovery that they were involved with with this man. This is Solomon Schechter, the Jewish rabbi I mentioned, and his wife, uh, Mary, who was a great friend. Now, uh, after one of their trips, a rather daunting trip, um, well, they'd actually crossed by land uh, from uh, Cairo to Gaza. They, they found a lot of manuscripts in, um, in Cairo. And this man, Solomon Schechter, looking at them when they were back in Cambridge, thought that they, he detected that they must come from a lost hoard of manuscript called a Geniza. Now, in developed um, Jewish thought, Anything with the holy name on it, Yahweh, cannot be destroyed. You have to treat it with the veneration you would give to a human body. So in Romania or, or um, Bulgaria, you would bury it. 
But in Cairo, where it's very dry, what the Jews of Cairo had been doing for a thousand years is in the, off the women's gallery in one of the oldest synagogues was this windowless room. That window you see there is the only aperture into this room. They've been winging anything with the name of God on it into that dark hole um, for a thousand years. And this included love letters, recipes, charms, amulets, copies of the Bible. It included the first draft of a very famous book, The Guide to the Perplexed by the philosopher Moses Maimonides, in his own handwriting. All this stuff had just been winged in there. And on the basis of what Agnes and Margaret had found, Schechter was able to go back, shortly accompanied by Agnes and Margaret, and get all this stuff, and, and he, was, he was able to bring it all back to Cambridge University Library, where here you see it's in packing chests, and he's um, beginning to work over it. It's still not fully catalogued. Most fabulous, you know, we speak about the Dead Sea Scrolls, but in some ways the Cairo Ganese, in terms of Jewish history, is a more monumental discovery. Well, Agnes and Margaret went on from strength to strength, and here's a photograph of Agnes, aged about 55, and this one I like. This is when they went, 1903, as Schechter's guest, he um, gave up academic life in uh, the early 1900s to go and be the first rector of the Jewish Theological Seminary in New York, and Agnes and Margaret were amongst his first speakers invited to speak. And here is the headline from a talk they gave in Philadelphia. Uh, two sister explorers turn light on the four gospels. But I like this, um, the artist depiction of the scene there. You see a, a fashionable lady in riding gloves carrying a box brownie like this big. The camera they had was this big, talking to a cowboy in a Stetson who I think is supposed to be Ahmed, their dragoman, and um, a Catholic priest who I think is supposed to be Father Galactian. But anyway, <laughs> these were early days. Um, So Agnes and Margaret continued. They were the first women, as I say, they went six times more to Sinai. They were the first women to go into the Coptic monasteries of the Nile. Uh, they became world-acclaimed Bible scholars, particularly of Syriac and Arabic Christian manuscripts, and the names are still dearly held. And uh, it was um, a most fascinating life in a sense of Phoenix-like change for them, that at the moment when they thought their life was truly over, it changed around and God opened up for them something absolutely fabulous. They had a, um, a f fantastic belief in providence. They believed that God knows the hour of our death. And for them, that was very cheery because if they were in a storm at sea, they thought, well, if we're going to die, we're not. We are. And if we're not, we're not. God knows. And that they found very consoling, though not everyone did. Um, but they found it consoling. It was partly what made them as brave as they were for traveling. And this great thing of hope, terrific amount of hope, um, I, I think that that's something we have learned to learn, many of us, from uh, the Victorians. I remember speaking to the person who's the custodian of their, their old house, is now a hall of residence, and I, I was mentioning that over the doorway says Spez, there's a, a, a terracotta plaque that says Spez, hope. And he said, oh, well, that's such a sad word, that's such a sad, sad word. And I said, why? And he said, well, if you hope, it means something's gone wrong, someone's ill, you're going to lose your job. But for... For Agnes and Margaret, and for many Victorians, it didn't mean that. It didn't mean that your cup once full is now empty. It meant hope in God means the cup may be half empty, maybe three quarters, can be full to overflow, and we don't know how many glorious ways God may fulfill it. And their life surely was a sign of this and their motto, and it was not consumed. Thank you. Okay, we've got five minutes, so we can take a couple of questions. If What you need to do if you're going to ask a question is come out here and use the microphone. So is there anyone who'd like to ask anything? This man here, well done, you nice and quick. Anyone else? I can... Just wondered if you had any thoughts about whether there, what the chances are of any other famous uh, un unknown manuscripts turning up in the, in the desert. 
I think there are. There's still manuscripts turning up all the time. It's fascinating. One thing, it's been a real busman's holiday for me because I'm a philosopher of religion, not a text scholar. And uh, this world of text scholarship is so, so detailed. But they found something a couple of years ago in, in one of the libraries in an Oxford college. What it would be would be something bound in with another volume. They found, as you probably know, 25 years ago, a whole bunch of um, um, sermons, previously lost sermons of St. Augustine were discovered in a public library in Mainz in Germany. And the book had simply been catalogued wrong. Again, I think it was a question of a bunch of things bound together and it had been catalogued according to a front thing, but no one knew these sermons of Augustine were there. So things are turning up all the time. I was talking, I, I gave a talk at the De, um, Department of Egyptian Literature in Coptic uh, in um, the Catholic University of America last year, and they had been brought in um, a Syriac Bible by a, a local family who none of them read Syriac, but they'd from, been from Syria and they had this. And it turned out it wasn't a Syriac Bible at all, it was a manuscript from the 11th century that, again, people knew of its existence, but no one had ever seen a copy. So, yes, things still are turning up. And uh, just last summer, they found some previously unknown fragments of the Codex Sinaiticus were discovered at St. Catherine's. So, you know, um, some of these potentially could be very, very exciting. And the sermons of St. Augustine were very exciting. But I think as far as the Bible goes, we now are pretty confident that we have a very good, um, very good and reliable text. And this is one of the things, you know, frankly, most scholars at the beginning of the 19th century were pretty skeptical about wh how, whether we'd ever be able to find a good reliable Greek first, you know, text. And uh, what, what scholars like Agnes and Margaret, Rendell Harris, all of them discovered is just fabulous. Crowned, in a sense, by the work in the early 20th century with papyrus in, in, in Egypt, where, you know, for instance, many people thought the Gospel of John must be very late because it's so philosophical and stuff. The earliest fragments we have, as many of you will know, are John's Gospel, and they date... Um, from about 1.30 there in Dublin. Uh, and, uh, you know, just no one could have expected we'd be able to push back the veracity of the text so far. Okay, we'll just take one more question. You mentioned this is not your, your usual field. I just wondered what inspired you to write the book, which I read and enjoyed. It's very readable, but uh, mm. what moved you to do it? Mm. Well, I, I've become sort of a burning bush obsessive, I think. I, I, um, I'm writing a book on the names and the naming of God, um, which is a lot about the unnameability of God in the philosophical tradition. And, and um, they had all the... the historical texts and that by the rabbis and the Christian theologians go back to Moses in the burning bush and Moses asking God for a name and God saying I am who I am. So um, some years ago one of my grad students said no you're always going on about this we've got to go and she organized a little trip and when I came back someone from Westminster College must have said well of course you know about these two ladies and I guess I knew about them you know but, but I never really thought about their story and uh, that just fired me to think about it. And then once I got involved, um, everything else fell in. But it was also very exciting for me as a theologian. I've, I've talked at, the, as it were, the level of theory so much about narrative and storytelling, the gospels and narrative. Narrative is the ideal form of Christian communication. But yet theology, very little theology is written as a narrative. So the chance for me to write a narrative and then bring in theology, because that's the way people can read it. So I may never be able to write another book like it. That's the sad part, but I'll try. <laughs> Once again, Janice Soskis, thank you. Thank you.